So talented people have migrated. They've migrated to hedge funds or they trade their own money. You know, guys like myself, you know. Um, you know, guys like myself can earn as much, if not more, than we used to doing our own thing rather than going to work for an investment bank now. So I would say it's difficult to say within the industry when overall the quality's gone down. So, you know, I think it's a really tough job now for graduates. You know, if, you're, if you manage to get into these, to get into these companies, um, I think it's a tough situation because once you're there, from my perspective, from what I used to see and the people I used to work with, a lot of these people just aren't around anymore. So the talented people have all left. So it's a bit of a minefield that you're going to turn up and learn from people that aren't really that talented or not very good at what they do. Because if you're talented, you get paid. You know, what you get paid is, is uh, I'm afraid to say, a recognition of your talent, okay? But what happen what's happened in the industry now is it's in structural decline because of regulation. So all the talented people who used to get paid all the money, who used to be innovative, entrepreneurial, got paid the big bucks, either now work for themselves or have gone to hedge funds or left the Western world altogether, and now they're in emerging or frontier markets. Um, so within the investment banks, I would still say Goldman Sachs uh, is slightly head and shoulders above most banks. Uh, culturally, I think pretty much outside of that, everyone's the same. You know, it's, it's difficult to differentiate. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, come on. Uh, oh my God, <laughs> that's a pretty open-ended question. Yeah. Could be here all night. Um, from my experience actually in the professional and retail world, because when I came out of the professional world, I totally forgotten what it was like to trade with your own money. Now going to, back to what I was talking about earlier, where when I was 18, 19 years old at uni, getting up at 6 a.m., you know, when lectures started at 9, 10. Uh, you know, I look back at that and now realize when I see retail traders, probably the most important thing is you have to be a self-starter. You have to be somebody who is highly motivated to go out into the world and seek out your own information and work for yourself. Now, if you're doing it within a company, when you're working for yourself, you're really working for the company because there's a big collection of individuals with all, all with self-interest called a company, essentially. And if you're on a trading desk, all of those guys, they're all thoroughbred self-starters, no doubt about it. You have to want to get up in the morning. You have to love the market. You have to seek out the information. You have to come up with innovative ideas. You have to be entrepreneurial, do business with your clients, and find ideas in the market that are going to make you a lot of money because the market hasn't realized the opportunity exists. So to get those ideas, you've got to go back to the basic, which is you really have to be a self-starter. We'll take one more. Yeah. Based on your experience uh, in terms of trading, uh, is there anything you can't learn from uh, I mean, as in, when you trade by yourself, mm. is there anything that you can't learn by uh, working for investment banks? Meaning, as in, if you work for investment banks, there are things that you learn which you can't really... Well, traditionally, the argument was the professionals see the order flow in the market. Therefore, they have an information advantage. Well, I can tell you, when you're sitting at an investment bank on a trading desk, internally, they think everybody else has the advantage. Because what they're doing is trading with you know, hedge funds. The hedge funds are coming in, and the market makers and the traders are taking the risk that the hedge funds are giving them. So they're using the bank's balance sheet to make prices to hedge funds. Now, a lot of hedge funds in the past have been what you describe as hot, hot money. So they come in, and they know something that you didn't know, and they take you out in a stock and you'd be short, and they'd be long. And then the stock would move 10, 20% against you. you know, so you know, at investment banks, traditionally the argument was from the outside, from the retail trader, and even from the hedge fund industry, well, they've got the order flow, so they know whether a stock's going down or whether a stock's going up, or an asset 
Yeah. Um, whereas the guys at investment banks think the information advantage is outside at the hedge funds because they speak to everybody. Okay. No longer the case at the investment banks, really, in terms of order flow, because now everything's put in a machine. So, you know, in the old days, you used to be able to take uh, uh, an order in a stock, and a lot of people would, uh, would uh, use the order to bully the stock around, you know, push it to levels that they wanted it to go to. It just doesn't happen anymore. Um, everything goes in a machine, and then you've got other liquidity uh, pools, you know, like the dark pools, where people can trade without seeing counterparty, without knowing what level they're trading at until they get the execution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what's great about the internet is honestly now I came out the professional side, and I've done four years of trading with my own money again. What's great about the internet is all the information is actually there. You can actually get it all for very cheap cost or free. But what's more important is actually knowing how to interpret that information and turn it into real hard dollars. So that's probably the most important thing. So after retiring from the banking industry, you took a, took a year out traveling. Is that just a case of uh, well-earned time off? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not scared to admit it. You know, after seven, seven and a half years, I was very burnt out. Hmm. You know, but and I felt like I deserved a break. You know, when I, I grew up in Liverpool, left from Liverpool when I was 18 to go to Manchester University, went to university for three years, was hired by Goldman in my final year for nine months' time. After my final exam, which was, I still remember the date, June the 12th, three weeks later, I was on a plane to New York and I was working for Goldman. So, uh, you know, and then you have two weeks' holiday a year. So I'd never had a break. I'd never seen the world. So I wanted to go and do that and take a break and then reassess whilst, you know, I, I also thought the market was going down. So <laughs> being short in that situation when everyone's long, you don't get paid at these places. So it's a waste of time. So, uh, you know, offered to go back into the industry by a few places, but declined, sold my property in London and got on a plane around the world for 14 months with one bag of clothes. So your, your next venture was working on BBC programme, Million Dollar Traders. Ooh. How did that come about? Uh, I was sitting on a beach in Brazil, uh, drinking a caipirinha, and got a phone call from a guy I used to work with at Goldman Sachs, who had come up with the idea and the concept, uh, Lex Van Damme. And uh, he literally point blank asked me, do you want to get involved in the TV programme? At this stage, believe it or not, uh, traveling around the world, this was like 13 months down the line, traveling around the world, seeing jungles, cities, beaches, and bumming around for 13 months gets a little bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> the grass is always greener, right? But um, I was bored. So, you know, this situation was literally uh, a good stepping stone to come back into the Western world after you've been away for so long. You know, just come back, put yourself out there. And, you know, I liked the, the concept of it. Um, the idea that if we trained people and gave them a couple of weeks training and then gave them a million dollars and just let them loose on the market whilst the market environment was the worst it's ever been, <laughs> yeah. um, we'd probably find some pretty interesting results. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the, from the outset, the, the objective of the show really was to show two things. One, that actually anybody can trade if you get the right instruction and you're willing to work a little bit at it and you have the kind of right mindset. That's the first thing. But also that it's actually quite tough. You know, not everybody can do it. So I think, you know, a lot of people in the, in the market like this gentleman over here, we were discussing the conflict of interest earlier. Due to this conflict of interest in the, the retail broker, brokerage market, you'll get told by a lot of people that anyone can trade. You know, you'll get emails all the time, make $10,000 a month in the international forex market. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, is that not everyone can do it, and a lot of it is lies. So you have to be very, very careful. 
Um, so we set, we set out you know, with an objective to prove that people can do it, but in a certain way, but not everyone can do it. And I think it was you know, pretty successful. Okay, so well, by doing that, you must have created a, a public image. So mm. how, how, did you, how did you deal with that? Or how did that affect your life? Uh, well, I was, when I came back, I was, uh, what the, in, terms, in terms of timetable, what happened, I came back uh, May 2008. Started filming the TV programme two weeks later. We actually did filming here, upstairs. We f and actually, next door in the rooms here, we interviewed people, and then we did most of the training upstairs. Um, but in terms of timetable, uh, the show took about 10 weeks to film. And then we finished filming on August the 31st, 08. And then I took off again. I went traveling for another four months. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I wasn't here for any reason except that. And then the show was aired January, February, 09. And then I was back in London again and renting an apartment by Tower Bridge. Um, it became a bit weird, if you like, because I'd, I'd used to walk into the city to see my old buddies and workmates, you know, for lunch. We'd be sitting around, and there was one situation which was a bit weird. Uh, a guy ran across the street and picked me up and started hugging me. <laughs> He's like a guy in his, like, mid-40s. I was like, okay, uh, yeah, could I help you? <laughs> He's like thanking me. He's like, thank you so much, thank you so much, thank you so much. I'm like, why? He's like, uh, my wife now understands what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's other uncomfortable situations. You know, that's good stuff to know, but it's a bit uncomfortable. Uh, you know, there's other uncomfortable situations, like uh, I was out maybe a month or two after the show had finished, and a bunch of guys in the city were all drunk and they just surrounded me in a bar and would not let me leave. They were like, you're staying out with us the whole night. <laughs> and they were just giving me drinks and drinks and drinks and just forcing me to stay out with them. And like, my friends were leaving and I'm like, I can't believe I've got to stay out with these people who I don't even know. 